Good evening. It's great to see you all here. Welcome to the Oberlin Debate Series. This promises to be a most interesting discussion about one of the hot button topics in our society, affordable health care. It certainly appears that the national debate is centering on the Affordable Care Act as a topic for the 2014 elections. The scope and, imp and implementation of that legislation is expected to be one of the key issues in the upcoming elections. I want to mention that Steve Shapiro, our former trustee, has been part of the inspiration for this debate series and his support continues to help animate this discussion series, this debate and discussion series. We are so fortunate to have with us tonight Dr. Ted Marmer is Professor Emeritus at Yale University and Scholar of the Modern Welfare State formerly the director of the Robert Wood Johnson's Foundation's postdoctoral program in health policy. He lectures on policy and management issues and has been a consultant to government and nonprofit agencies. He's also authored or co-authored 13 books and 200 scholarly journal articles. I'll just say that among his many other credentials, he did teach me in a healthcare seminar many, many, many years ago, so you can hold him responsible for my uh, lack of knowledge or knowledge as you determine. Um, Dr. David Henderson is an associate professor of economics at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, and a research fellow with the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He is editor of the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics and has written nearly 200 articles for the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Barron's, and various other publications. He has appeared on C-SPAN, CNN, The O'Reilly Factor, MSNBC, NPR, and the BBC. Moderating tonight's debate is Oberlin's own Tim Hall, Associate Professor of Philosophy and Chair of the Department of Philosophy. So the way the evening will go will be introduced by Professor Hall, and there will be time for questions when the debate concludes. So please join me in welcoming to Oberlin Ted Marmer, David Henderson, and our own Timothy Hall. Good evening, all, and thank you very much for coming tonight. And thank you to President Krizlov, the staff of the college, the students, and my colleague, Professor Mark Blecker in the politics department, the fellow committee member on the Oberlin Debate Committee, for the hard work for tonight's event. Without any further ado, I would like to begin by getting into the details of our discussion tonight. I have provided an information sheet that contains some key provisions of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, hence the title, Some Key Provisions <laughs> of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. You might find it useful at various points tonight to refer to this, so uh, please avail yourselves of a copy. So I'd like to begin, actually, by asking both of our interlocutors tonight if they would care to offer any further comments on the major provisions of the Affordable Care Act, as detailed on the sheet. And I'll ask for the moment that you hold remarks to do with criticisms, claims of support, or other remarks about costs and benefits of the Affordable Care Act. Again, just for the moment. So I'll begin with you, Professor Marmor. What, if, is there anything you would like to say about the details of the Affordable Care Act itself? Well, I think you've described quite well the ex effort to expand health insurance in the United States through these various devices. I think it's helpful, it may not be, but I do think it's helpful to think about the Affordable Care Act as a series of patches on the pre-existing patchwork of American medical care. And so if you think about American medical care as five different worlds of health care, one, the socialized medicine, that we have called the VA, where in which the government owns the means of production and hires the people at salary. Two, we've got Medicare, uh, as illustrated by Part A, which is classic social insurance. People contribute to a pool, and because of that contr contribution, they're eligible when they're 65 or disabled for a common benefit. Three, we've got 50 poor, poor law, means-tested programs called Medicaid in which you have to fall into an income and asset level in order to be eligible. And the theory of entitlement is you're in bad enough shape having been caught by the safety net. 
The fourth is employment-related insurance, which basically says where you work determines what kind of health care insurance you've got. Not everybody, but for the great bulk. And then finally, we've got a fifth, uh, which is, which is the, what some of you will know, the National Emergency Room Law, a federal law that says Americans will not tolerate a situation in which someone is brought to the emergency room and then is given a wallet biopsy and dumped somewhere else. You, know, you lose all of your capacity to receive benefits from any of the public programs if you don't go along with that non-dumping. So my point would be what Tim has described as the provisions constitute some of the patches on that patchwork. And the only thing I want to say initially is that if we are patches on a patchwork, anybody with serious experience of the reform of organizations would know that there are many, many opportunities when you patch a patchwork on boundary problems. And in order to weave together a quilt from patches on a patchwork, mean you have to be extraordinarily sensitive to all the things that can go wrong at the boundaries. And that leads me to my final conclusion from that description, which is that what was tried in the Affordable Care Act in 2010 was an extraordinarily ambitious effort to try to fill in the gaps of American medical care, and sadly, to my mind, was done so in a way in which the implementation has completely clouded out the aspirations that were there at the very outset. Well, good. Well, that's a good point to note some themes to follow up on in coming questions. Professor Henderson, would you like to add any further remarks about the contents of the Patient Protection and Affordable well, Care Act? Well, first of all, I think my, my comments are going to be shorter because I think this is a very comprehensive list. I think it's very well done. So I want to just mention one little thing missing from here and then just add something to what Ted said. By the way, how's my volume? OK, good. The Medicaid expansion and subsidies, number five, my understanding is that at some point, only a few years from now, the federal government will pull out its funding, a large percent of its funding. It's funding a large percent of that expansion. And then the states will be stuck with it. Because you might wonder why some states are hesitating to take this on when it looks like free money from the federal government. Well, it's free money for a few years. Three years. Three years, right. And so then the other thing I just want to add is, well, first of all, I think Ted did a good job of explaining the patchwork. And it does make the point that I hope we get to sometime this evening, that what the pre-existing situation was was not one of a totally free market in health care. We have not had a free market in health care in a century. And I hope we might get a chance to talk about what that free market would look like. Good, thanks. Well, one of the themes I'm hoping we'll talk about tonight is not only details of commentary to do with the Affordable Care Act itself, but approaches that might be considered with respect to the provision of health care more broadly in our country. And in keeping with that, hope. I'd like to ask each of our speakers here tonight, beginning with Professor Henderson, a question about a comparison between the United States and other countries. So even before any discussion of the Affordable Care Act a few years ago, commentators interested in the provision of health care compared health care provision in the United States to that in many other countries, and in particular to that in many other first world countries. Some commentators point out that in the recent past and now, American health care provides excellent outcomes in some important areas, such as the treatments of cancers and serious heart diseases. Others argue that American health care is deficient in some areas, such as prenatal care, measurements of public health more broadly, equality of access, as it's described, to high quality care, and the financial burden on some individual patients. So I'm interested first in your thoughts, Professor Henderson. What do each, what do you believe are the most important lessons to draw in comparing American healthcare more broadly to other countries? Okay, thank you. 
And by the way, Tim is timing us uh, at three minutes each, so I'm timing myself, too, because I want to I wanna use my time well. Conscientious. <laughs> I think, okay, the biggest lesson is that every country has its problems. And virtually all of the countries, with the possible exception of Singapore, have one main problem in common. Patients do not directly bear much of the cost of their health care and therefore do not have a strong incentive to purchase wisely to watch it, to pay attention to costs. Also, and of course I know the United States best, but it's also true in every country, including Singapore, that there are substantial restrictions on supply. It, there are restrictions on who can be a doctor, and there are restrictions on building hospitals, building medical facilities, and so on. And those restrictions vary substantially from country to country. Now, how about the actual performance of the healthcare system? Many of you have probably heard of the WHO, World Health Organization, which is part of the UN, ranking our system in the United States at 37th in the world. Well, it turns out you need to look, you always, when you look at data, need to look at how they came up with the data. And it turns out that 25% of the ranking is based on something called financial fairness. And that's measured by the dispersion in the percent of disposable household income that people spend. And of course, in this country where low-income people spend a larger percent of their income on health care than high-income people do, we're going to look bad by that measure. Now, that, you might like that. You might say, well, you know what? That's a good measure. But it's, a not, it's not a measure of the quality of the health care. Another 25% of, of the measure is based on what's called health distribution, and that is the equality of the actual health care. So think about what that means. A country where everyone gets really lousy health care is going to be rated very high. Whereas a country where the, a lot of people get good health care and a lot of people get great health care is going to be rated lower because it's not equal. Also, by the way, we're often measured, we, we get life expectancy at birth measured, but it turns out they have a different view here in the United States versus other countries on premature babies. A premature baby here will be counted as a live birth. In many countries, that's not true. And so if you look at uh, the number of babies born per 10,000 who are under 1.1 pounds, it's 16.9 in the United States. It's 1.9 in Norway. That's mainly a measurement issue. That's not an actual difference in infant mortality. Life expectancy at birth, my time's up, so I'll, I will stop. Thank you. Uh, Professor Marmer, would you like to elaborate on the appropriate way to think about comparing healthcare in the United States to that of other countries? Only if I get three minutes and one second in order to say <laughs> it. Um, there's lots of things to be said, and in three minutes it's not a very important matter how much you include. I would, I would say the central lesson that Americans should get by comparing their circumstances with those of other first world countries, by the way, would be that in all of those other countries, medical care is not thought of as an ordinary market good to be distributed or allocated according to the ability and willingness to pay that we use for most market transactions. That's the most important thing to know. That's true of all of the EU countries. It's true of our neighbor to the north. It's true of Australia and, it, and Japan as well. And the question is, what a, we all learn that that's the case. And then we ought to ask ourselves, what, what should we take away? What lessons should we draw from that? And I think the lesson we should draw from that is that in all of these other countries, as in many parts of the American public, the conviction that medical care is a special kind of good or service is widely shared. You can get to that position by many philosophical routes. You can see it as a basic need. You can see it as something that justifies the market competition later on if you have a fair equal start. But what I really want to emphasize is the following, namely, that with respect to all of our competitors, the balance among the contending elements in any medical care system, the cost of the care, the quality of the care, 
the fairness of financing and the complexity of the care, on every one of those measures, America has a hard time being satisfied with where we are. We spend 18 percent of our gross national product on it. By comparison, our northern neighbor, Canada, spends about 10, even though in 1970, before they got universal health insurance, we spent identical proportions of, of our income on medical care. Secondly, and I think very important, it's not just cost. If we were satisfied with the results, that would be quite another thing. Why wouldn't we be prepared to spend more? The answer is the Affordable Care Act illustrated not simply that 52 million Americans were uninsured at any one moment, but even more importantly, 90 million Americans were uninsured at some point over a two-year period. So the economic uncertainty about the consequences of medical care is very much a problem in the United States, to which the ACA has only brought partial response. And then finally, and I think I want to end on this if I'm still within my time. What? You have a few seconds. A few seconds. Would be to just highlight for you the complexity of American medical care, a complexity that sadly, to my view, the Affordable Care Act only contributes to rather than reduces. We have no reason, by comparison with the circumstances of other places, to be complacent about the way in which we deliver finance medical care. Well, thanks. And actually, your comments provide a nice segue into another question I want to ask both of you. Food is an essential good. And in the United States, food is largely provided under conditions that allow for a competitive market in providers and which permit individuals to buy food according to their needs, preferences, and budgets. When the government wants to make it easier for poor and low-income people to buy food, it provides food stamps so that people can buy their own food in line with their own preferences. One question, if the government wants more health care for people, why not provide subsidies for people, either to buy health care or health insurance, as they choose? Why regulate in detail the structure of the provision of health care, the nature of coverages, and the like, not only for those who are poor, but for everyone? And I'll begin with you, Ted. Well, I, I think my answer follows from the point I made in the last, in the last exchange. If you regard medical care as a merit good and not a market good, then you are committed to the view that it ought to be allocated <coughs> with respect to the seriousness of the medical need and something about the capacity to benefit from the medical intervention. That, di that distributes. Now, it's true that food is a basic need. Without it, it's even more basic than medical care in the short run. That is, the denial of it will soon end your life. <laughs> um, but notice. Uh, Tim, it's very interesting that you, it, this is your question, too. <laughs> we regulate food left, right, and center. We don't let people choose any kind of food they want. The FDA is involved in this, this question. The Agriculture Department worries about bad food. So the sharp dichotomy, which your question suggested, is inappropriate. But what's really important is that the taste for food is very different than the taste for medical care. We care a lot about whether or not you get medical care. I'm not at all interested, uh, Tim, respectfully, whether your taste for vegetables is high, <laughs> medium, or low. So that our social interest is radically different on the distribution of access. And finally, what is stunningly obvious, is I don't see why I need to give anybody else advice about what it is they like. I might give them advice about what's good for their diet, uh, but I don't think the same applies to medical care. Well, thanks. Well, as your humble moderator, I won't engage in any debate on the uh, question. I'll turn it over to much. David. David, what would you like to well, say in thank response you. to this question? Um, and I want to just finish up, because I think I can do everything in my three minutes, what I didn't get to. One big difference with, between us and most other countries, developed countries, is in the amount of time it takes to get an appointment to see a doctor once you get an appointment to see a doctor, the amount of time it takes to see a specialist, and then once you see a specialist, the amount of time it takes to actually get treated. And I come from Canada, eh? And there are only four people who understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's how you know. I never talk about ice hockey. We call it hockey. And 
I'm used to, because I've had friends in this situation, especially older friends, especially particularly my father, who actually have had to wait for health care, sometimes pretty vital health care. So let me give you one statistic. The time you have to wait for cataract surgery in the United States is close to zero. The average time you have to wait for cataract surgery in, in Europe is about three and a half months. That's just one, one example. I also want to point out that the numbers on percent of, of income spent, percent of GDP spent on health care is misleading because, say, Greece, which is an extreme example, there's bribery throughout the system. And some people have estimated that the amount of money spent on bribes to get into a hospital, to get into a doctor, is equal to the percent of GDP that's actually reported as being spent. Now back to the food example. I actually like Ted's que uh, sorry, uh, uh, Tim's question because I agree. I think don't if, mix this up. Yeah, right. Right, right. if you have a problem with people being poor, give them money. Or if you want them to purchase a particular thing, give them vouchers so that they, and by the way, don't have the vouchers just so they can spend it on health insurance. Have it so they can spend it on health insurance or health care. And there's a, those are not the same thing. I think actually Ted made a good point. Wait a minute, this isn't as big a dichotomy as, as Tim suggested. No, I meant Ted. <laughs> because look, the FDA does regulate food. And I agree, they do, and I think they should not. Uh, go sometime. Thank I was, you very much, Dave. <laughs> I was, in a, I was at a, in a restaurant in um, Santa Fe a few years ago when I was at a conference, and I got talking to this woman beside me who was into this whole organic thing and raising chickens free farm, free whatever, free whatever. <laughs> and, and she pointed out that the, the USDA comes down hard on them and they want them to do all kinds of testing and so on, and they don't have the economies of scale to do that. There are economies of scale and compliance, and those things are causing you to have a more bland set of choices than you would have if we didn't have that regulation. You remember the, it was the mad cow thing, not mad cow, the other one a few years ago, where there was a, a company in Kansas City that wanted to actually test for this disease and say, look, we, we don't have this problem, and the USDA said you can't. Well, thanks, David. Ted indicated he had a response a, to do with incentives, so why don't we give you each a couple minutes to follow up? Okay. Well, just, maybe just a minute. Um, uh, I think the invocation of Greece and the measurement problems with Greece actually blurs rather than clarifies matters. I made my comparison between Canada and the United States, and there is nothing like that problem in that comparison. And what's more, we know a lot about what explains the difference between our expenditures. And I just want to mention two. One is the overwhelming bulk of the difference in our expenditures is the prices we pay for the same medical care. Let's face it, you know that, David, so it's not an argument about that. The second, and you're right, that for elective surgery, Canadians spend more time waiting, without a doubt. But the word elective is actually a clue to that. And what's more, and it's, here's what's really important, if, you're gonna, if we use the elective surgery data, we also should use the office visits per capita and the bed days per thousand. And on both of those measures, Canadians get more medical care per capita than we do. So it's a balancing act between surgery, access to doctors, and elective surgery. And you're, that's the kind of balance evaluation I think we need to do. So one minute and 15 seconds, David. <laughs> OK. So you're right about elective, but that's not the only thing going on. Uh, but it's the bulk of it. Uh, I was on a flight to see my father once, and I was sitting beside this guy from Canada. I was flying into Winnipeg, and we got talking. And he said he had lung cancer. And I said, well, what happened? He, well, I'm still waiting for my surgery. How long have you been waiting? Three months. Now, that kind of thing doesn't happen here. You can call it elective but I don't think you would. It's not elective. Well, you don't I mean, know enough about that case to be sure about what the let's circumstances let's are. Let's no, no, come on, come on. Um, and, and so let me point that, that out. Let me say also, Ted's absolutely right, prices are lower, and that's why people are lining up. Uh, but by the way, Canada is extreme in this sense. There are three countries in the world where you can't legally pay for lots of different health care. One is Cuba, one is North Korea, and one is Canada. Now, there are some provinces where you can, but there are some provinces where you cannot legally pay, and that's a problem. That for another time. 
Interesting, thanks. Um, I would like to turn to the Affordable Care Act now, if I could. And I'd like to ask each of you uh, about some of the provisions of the act itself. I won't rehearse them in detail, and that's part of the reason for the sheet I've distributed. But I do want to ask about one of the goals of the act, which is to improve the outcomes of health care provision. And one question I have has to do with the connection between the details of the Affordable Care Act and innovation in medical treatment. And again, without rehearsing in, details, in detail the contents of the act itself, I'm curious to know whether and what you have to say about the fact that a government having control over the insurance and the health care might have unanticipated effects on the development of new technologies and therapies that will improve the provision of health care. So I'd like each of you to comment on that, if you would. And if you have anything to say about the details of the act as connected to the question, please, please do. Who goes first? So this would be David. Oh, okay. Well, I do think that there's a huge danger whenever you have a government that has a lot more control than it had of slowing down innovation. I think it's kind of hazy how things are going to develop. There's, uh, a, there's an agency now within HHS, Health and Human Services, that might have some say over these kinds of things, and we aren't really clear on the contours of that. So it's very hard to say. I do think that medical practice will be affected. I think doctors will find there'll be some kind of a wave of regulation, and that could matter for innovation. Do I think innovation will stop? No, I don't. I think innovation continues. There's always an incentive. There's always a desire to make things better. And fortunately, the federal government controls only things in the United States. And so there'll be innovations in Sweden. Japan and so on. My concern, since we're talking about health care, is not so much about the Affordable Care Act hurting innovation and improvement, but organizations like the Food and Drug Administration. The Food and Drug Administration prevents drugs from being on the market for years while they try to while the drug companies try to establish efficacy. So in other words, they establish safety. That doesn't take so long. Efficacy can take five or 10 years. And there are drugs approved in other countries, Europe, Canada, Australia, that we can't get. So I don't know if you heard about the students at Princeton a year ago with the meningitis. And the FDA took its time allowing that vaccine, even though that vaccine was legal in Canada, Australia, and Europe. And then there was an outbreak at UC Santa Barbara and between the time of the outbreak and the time they started allowing vaccinations was three months. So my concern isn't so much the Amer Affordable Care Act as it is other parts of the government that are just going along doing their job of slowing things down. Thanks. Uh, Ted. Well, we don't disagree very much about that. Um, it's true that the FDA in the United States trades off safety for innovation all the time. We've had experiences in our history in which the failure to do so produced scandal, and people are risk averse about that. I see no reason to believe that that's going to change very much in connection with the Affordable Care Act, so it doesn't bear on our evaluation of the Affordable Care Act. I do think, though, that we have to watch out for believing all innovation is a good thing. In the pharmaceutical industry, for much of the last uh, 10 to 15 years, Me Too drugs have dominated that. Uh, and the extent to which that really added very much. The real point about, about innovation in the drug, the pharmaceutical world, is not about whether or not we delay the period of approval, is what we do about the prices of those drugs. And that has to do with countervailing power, and it, it helps to explain why in the United States we've gone since Medicare was enacted from spending 8% of GNP on, on pharmaceuticals to 16% of GNP next last year. And some of that is wonderful, and some of that's not. You mean on health care? On health care, right. uh, proportion right. on our drugs. Some of it's 
meritorious and some of it's not. I just, I resist the idea that change in and of itself is a good thing. We've got so many other problems with the medical circumstances we've got and the therapies we already have. I'm less concerned about the ACA as a dampener on innovation than I am concerned about it being wiser about what are the innovations we pay for. Can I take half a minute and then he can have half a minute? I'm going to ask about affordability, and um, but actually, yes. Okay. Uh, so, so I think he, Ted, men <laughs> Go ahead. Ted mentioned Me Too drugs. A Ford is a Me Too Chevrolet. And the reason Chevrolet is priced as low as it is is because Ford is competing. Ted doesn't like high drug prices, neither do I. How do you protect yourself against high drug prices? Have competitors. How do you have competitors? Have lots of Me Too drugs. And one of the things the FDA has done recently is raise the bar on how different a drug has to be in order to, to be allowed. And so we aren't getting some of those Me Too drugs that would actually break down drug prices. That was about 40 seconds, but can't tell you. <laughs> Ted, 40 seconds, would you like well, to Well, sadly, <laughs> this, is, this is a complicated area. And I'm an expert witness in law cases in which the pharmaceutical industry is being sued by almost every state in the nation for lying about their prices. I, I'm a lot less content with your picture of how competition works in the generic industry, but let's leave that as not a central issue of the ACA evaluation. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to ask next about the question of affordability. Proponents of the Affordable Care Act see it as aimed at making health care affordable for all, or nearly all Americans, reducing overall health care costs, along with maintaining and, in some cases, improving medical outcomes. So one question I want to ask has to do with affordability to individuals and some of the conditions that the Affordable Care Act imposes. In particular, though there is a mandate for individuals to have insurance, either through an employer or elsewhere, as indicated on our sheet. Insurers must accept any individual applying for health care. And at least as it is now, the tax imposed on individuals who don't buy health insurance is lower than would be expected for the premiums for an individual plan. So one of the worries is individuals will sign up for health insurance only when they're sick thus making the costs to those who regularly pay premiums high. So as far as this possible problem might affect the affordability of health insurance for individuals or groups, I'm interested in your comments. Uh, we'll start with you, Ted. Well, you raise actually a lot of issues there, Ted, really. One is the question of why was there the mandate in the first place? And the mandate in the first place was in order to avoid a situation in which uh, citizens would free ride uh, on this arrangement and only come at the last minute. That's why the mandate was put forward, to address that particular problem. Now, if the penalty is less than would be serious for the decision maker, you've got a practical problem and you've just identified it. And over time, if you're serious about dealing with this unfairness, people waiting for the last minute and not sharing in the cost, then you raise the penalty. That's, that's, question, that's answer number one. Now, the design problem there is a fear that if you make the penalty too great, you will produce results that are just grotesque. That is, people are going to jail for failure to pay the penalty. And we actually have a lot of experience uh, in both Switzerland and in Holland with efforts to do precisely this, so maybe I can give this concrete illustration. When in 2006, the Dutch government went from a situation in which 60% of the population, up to the 60th percentile, were required to have the equivalent of Medicare, and 40% could do whatever they want, with a result, amazingly enough, that 99% of the Dutch were insured voluntarily for the group that I was talking about. When they shifted to a mandate in the requirement with penalties, two things happened. One, they had to have an increase of 25% in their IRS personnel in order to adjust the subsidies to require, that were required to get people fast to be able to pay for the particular required uh, 
instead of it being mandated and paid for out of taxes, it was going to be paid for out of premiums with subsidies, just like us. And the second thing that happened, which is amazing when you think about it, talk about unintended consequences. The rate of uninsurance tripled from 1% to 3% in Holland. That is, people's lives were, that are sufficiently troubled, whether by alcohol, unemployment, whatever it happens to be, weren't paying their, their fees. And the Dutch government, in order to avoid the embarrassment of a tripling of the level of uninsurance, bought off all the insurance companies from canceling coverage. That's what I worry about when we get into complicated arrangements for subsidies for an activity that we ought to expect everybody to be insured against in the first place. Making it a matter of choice and subsidy introduces the possibility of this kind of unanticipated and bizarre result. Thanks. Uh, David? Yeah. In the provisions that Tim laid out, if you notice under number three, medical insurance provider regulation, if you turn the page, you see that age-based variation could be no more than three to one from oldest to youngest insured. Let me say more about that. The ratio of spending for the relatively old to the relatively young on health care is approximately six to one. And so insurance rates tended to reflect that. So a lot of young people, like most of the people in this audience, could get insurance relatively cheap because you're not going to use it very much. I, I think in my own case, I didn't actually file an insurance claim with my company until I was in my early 30s, even though I was insured all through my 20s. So you have this mandate, as both Tim and Ted have pointed out, the penalty for noncompliance is very low. So there's an incentive for young people to game the system because if they pay, they're going to be paying a lot because they, the, the part of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, is a transfer of wealth or transfer of income from the young to the old, causing young, older people to pay artificially lower premiums and young people to pay artificially higher premiums. So the incentive then is for the young to avoid it, to game the system, to stay out of it, and that's a problem. Now also it's a little bit ironic that it's called the Affordable Care Act because in fact there are mandates, there are mandated coverages, and the mandates actually don't allow the people to get out of it. So you can have a 60-year-old man who has to buy pregnancy insurance. We have friends who buy their own individual insurance. They, they have no children in the home. Their children are out past college age. They had to buy dental insurance for children, even though they have no children who will use it. So you have all these kinds of mandated coverages that are driving up the cost. So there's a big re rearrangement of income, a redistribution of income within the system, and overall higher costs. So it never really should have been called the Affordable Care Act. Ted, you want to follow up? I do. I, I, David do. and I just disagreed, to be clear, about the function of insurance. Health insurance necessarily redistributes income from the healthy to the less healthy. It redistributes income from the lucky to the less lucky. De, de, saying that that's what it does is like saying, yes, I, I got it. That's what it's supposed to do. Now, at any one point, you could have said, let's everybody in the United States be eligible for Medicare tomorrow. And then everybody would have been paying 1.45 of, of their wages up to, no, actually no longer to a premium, and their employers would be paying 1.45. You'd have no objection. It would be a proportional tax, young, middle, and old. It would still be the case that older Americans involve three, from three to six times more per person. That's the point. All of the young are going to be old. The idea, it's not anything bizarre about that. You're insisting on treating going to the health insurance as roughly like going to the restaurant in which people who have a taste for tacos are forced to subsidize people who have a taste for shrimp. That's not the deal. This is another kind of good and service. And you may object to that, but that's the point of social insurance. And the ACA is nothing but a set of indirect regulatory rules to try to get to social insurance 
by their inability to do it explicitly and directly. About 90 seconds if you want to follow up, David. Thank you. Okay, so he's making a point about what he calls social insurance, and if you define it the way I think Ted is implicitly doing, I think he's right. I'm making a point about insurance. There's this misunderstanding about what insurance is. People say it's to pool risk. That's true. It's to pool like risk. That's why you, Taylor, pay very high insurance rates for your car because you're one of these risky young guys, okay? Whereas there's probably a 60-year-old woman. I always knew that was true. <laughs> Stand up and speak up for it. There's, for a, there's, a, there's probably a 60-year-old woman in this crowd who's paying maybe a third of what you're paying for your car insurance because it reflects risk. And so I'm making a point about insurance. I understand that some people are lucky, some people are unlucky. That's the point going into insurance. You don't know which one you'll be, but the rates generally in insurance, in real insurance, reflect your real risk. And so I agree that the, what, the way they've designed it, and this is one of my criticisms, and this is one of the things Ted likes, but let's be clear, it's not really insurance in the sense we've used that in word. The private insurance sense. Correct. Well, these are, these are some topics that I think can be followed up on in the question and answer from the students and others oh in a bit. These are very interesting right. comments. There is a question I also want to make sure I'm able to ask the two of you here now in our formal session. The Affordable Care Act would allow the federal government near total access to the standardized and electronic medical records of all Americans. Given the recent, some would say, alarming revelations about government surveillance, of electronic communications throughout the country and indeed throughout the world, what assurances can Americans take in the real protection of their sensitive medical information, information that might include the use of illegal drugs, sexually transmitted diseases, psychological problems, and other very personal matters? So we'll start with, with I think David. Ted. Oh, David, I think you're next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I think that's a real problem. By the way, another hat I wear, and I probably should have put this in my bio, um, I used to write a regular column for antiwar.com. And I, uh, I just haven't recently. Uh, we've been so successful, you see, at avoiding wars. That, uh, but one of my concerns, and I actually confronted General Keith Alexander about this when he spoke at our graduation last June. He was the head of NSA. One of my concerns is our loss of privacy, and I just see this adding to it, that the government will now, at some point, have more data about our health status, more data about our background. Uh, at some point, I think doctors will be required to start asking us these kinds of questions. A doctor friend on Facebook told, said the other day he's already been have, have, having to do that. And so the, I don't trust the government. I don't trust the government to keep secrets. I think the information will get out. And I think the lack of privacy due to government involvement here is a huge problem. There was a famous Supreme Court case that said, I think it was Smith v. Maryland or something, that said, uh, well, when you put that information out there, it's no longer yours. My answer is, wait a minute. What if I say to a doctor, here's the agreement? I give you the information and you don't reveal it. Then, then that's a contractual arrangement and that should be enforced. But that's not how the Supreme Court sees it. And I do think we're going to lose a lot of our medical privacy. Ted, do you trust the government? Uh, it, it all depends who's in the government, frankly. <laughs> I don't have a generalized trust or non-trust. I actually don't have anything considered thoughtful or serious to say about this. This is an arena that I just don't have any comparative advantage over anybody in this room. I, I thought your premise was important. Namely, we've seen the extension of intervention that raises this issue for sure. Whether the stakes in government programs in knowing about our individual medical circumstances are analogous to the stakes they have in worrying about security strikes me as a, a stretch that I would put security much higher. I would say the positive incentives to pursue that. And also, I would say that the professional world of medicine is considerably more sensitive 
to the privacy concerns. Uh, and HIPAA, the legislation that's put forward, actually supports that. But you're right. Um, this is one of those areas that you, I, I would say more importantly, would be the misplaced faith in electronic medical records as a source of improved quality and source of cost control. That strikes me as mythical, whereas this one strikes me as a continuing concern highlighted by the Snowden revelations. And frankly, uh, prudence about this is the only possible response I could make. Thanks. Uh, I'd like in the time we have left to turn to the question of employment-based insurance and its connection to the Affordable Care Act. We have a question here. The Affordable Care Act mandates, as you can all see indicated, that employers with more than 50 full-time employees provide health insurance to those employees working 30 hours a week or more. Recently, the Congressional Budget, Budget Office estimated that this incentive for employers to reduce full-time employees will reduce employment nationally by the equivalent of two to 2.5 million full-time jobs between 2017 and 2024. As the Affordable Care Act subsidies decrease with income, furthermore, the outcome might be to leave low-wage workers who retain jobs with less incentive to work, undermining their prospects of building wealth and reducing national economic activity more broadly. Well, I'm interested in your comments on these concerns. I'll begin with you, Ted. Three. One, I think it's important to be careful how you characterize the impact on labor force participation. That estimate by the CBO was about a 1.5 to 2 percent drop in the number of hours worked rather than jobs lost. And I think you'd come to a very different view if you said that people who were locked into a job because of the access to health insurance would now be in a position to reduce their hours of work if they had good reason to do so. So the wish to spend somewhat less time at work is very different than losing a job, and I think there's a confusion between the figures that, or how to interpret the figures you put forward. Secondly, I think, I think it's undeniable that many people in this society feel paralyzed to leave the work that they have because they can't get insurance somewhere else. So job lock as a general matter is an important consideration. And to that extent, the availability of insurance under different terms is actually a loosening of the labor market and an improvement for many. But finally, I would say I'm not at all surprised by this finding. If you reduce the pressures on someone to stick within a particular labor market agreement, I'm not surprised that it does something to weaken it. But of all the considerations I would make in America of 2014, about the rate of unemployment, this would be 101st on my list. Thanks. Uh, David? Yeah, I just want to um, second the first point Ted makes. This isn't, I read, I reread the CBO study uh, a few days ago. This is not a, a supply, a demand side issue, this is a supply side issue, and, and let me explain. There are large subsidies for people with relatively low income, and by the way, those subsidies phase out up until your income is four times the positive poverty level. So it's not all just low income either. So think about a person who works an extra hour and earns an extra $12. That person's subsidy will fall by something like $2. So think of all the marginal taxes they pay. This is about a 16% percentage point additional marginal tax. And so if they're paying in the 15% federal bracket, the 4% state bracket, and the 7.65 Medicare and health insurance bracket, they go from a marginal tax rate of about 26% to a marginal tax rate of 42%. And that's a strong disincentive to work that extra hour. Ted's right that they're just cutting back and they see that as being better given the situation they're in. Paul Krugman made this point in a New York Times blog a few weeks ago, and I had an answer in an article I wrote on the Hoover website, Defining Ideas. It is true that if you just think of a standard subsidy that's being phased out, the people getting the subsidies are better off. 
and that was Krugman's point. But I pointed out, this is a subsidy for buying something that not everyone wants. So I took the extreme example. There was a car that was just an awful car in East Germany in the 1980s called a Trabant. <laughs> it was a horrible car. Imagine the government makes everyone in America buy a Trabant and then says, oh, by the way, if you're low income, we'll subsidize you. And then as you make more income, you'll lose some of the subsidy. You are not clearly better off having to buy the Trabant. Now, I'm not saying health insurance is exactly like a Trabant. Lots of people get lots of value from it. But lots of people don't get lots of value from it either because of things like mandated coverages that they don't care about. So you can't unambiguously say that these low-income people who are cutting back on their work are better off. They're better off cutting back than if they don't cut back, but they aren't better off necessarily cutting back than if they hadn't had this requirement in the first place. Um, Krugman estimated that this would cost the economy about 1% of GDP. In other words, the economy would be, be about 1% smaller than it otherwise would be. And I think that's true. And I think we should worry more about that. We should worry more about young people and low-income people looking at maybe not working as hard and their, the lack of in, in, initiative and so on that would happen because of this. Thanks. Well, I'm interested in asking both of you next, what are the most important things you would change about the Affordable Care Act, or if this is different for either one of you, the legislative approach to the provision of health care more broadly as compared to the way things are right now? Ted, or sorry, David, I'll begin with you. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd do is repeal it. Let's hear it, Mr. <laughs> Just take notice of and, that. Uh, and by the way, I don't know if you've ever seen this statistic. Congress has voted 43 times or something to repeal it. What's left out when people talk about that statistic is parts of it they did repeal and Obama signed them. So for example, I hire a gardener. I pay him $80 a month. That's $960 a year. Under the Affordable Care Act, I would have had to send him a form called a 1099. And there'd be all these bookkeeping requirements. They got rid of that. It was a bipartisan vote to get rid of that, and Obama signed it. Obama, by the way, has been repealing it without <laughs> congressional consent, as pointed out in this handout. He said, OK, let's just delay this, and let's delay that. In fact, he wanted to delay one of the employer mandates, and he did just by his decision, it wasn't, didn't, the law didn't allow that, but he did it anyway. Congress voted a bill to do what he did by executive action, and he threatened to veto it. Now, if that's not crazy, I don't know what is. Now, he never had to veto it, because Harry Reid, the head of the Senate, would not let it get voted on. Let's say I can't repeal it. There are two things I'd want to do. One is allow that ratio that I talked about, about premiums for the elderly versus premiums for the young, to go up to 7 to 1. That would solve a large part of the problem I'm talking about. That would price back a lot of young people into the insurance market who are holding back. The other thing I would want, economists, when, they're ta when they talk about health insurance, we tend to favor some kind of catastrophic insurance. What it means is a very high deductible, so you don't go bankrupt when you get sick. You, you get the big things covered. If you're going to have a mandate, mandate catastrophic insurance without all the bells and whistles, without all the add-ons, without all the requirement for covering pregnancy and PSA tests and so on. Have a real catastrophic plan. Those are the things I would do if I were in Congress. The other thing I would do is allow people to buy insurance, health insurance across state lines, which they're not allowed to do now. So if you can find an, a, a state that's relatively deregulatory, buy it there and pay a pr lower price that reflects that. Uh, Ted, what do you suggest as the most important changes that might be made to the Affordable Care Act, if any? I don't think there's any dramatic change that can be made to the act as passed that would change dramatically its projected uh, circumstances. That is, it's on a course of expanding Medicaid. It's going to be disappointing 
in that regard because of state objections to it. It's going to be run into troubles at the state exchanges, but people will get insurance. Youngsters who will stay with their families to age 26 will be better off than they would have been otherwise. Those will continue. I think there's no going back on the regulatory changes about uh, pre-existing conditions and about rescissions and about limits. All of those efforts to turn private health insurance in the United States into becoming something closer uh, to social health insurance, I think are no longer at, at risk to be, to be transformed. But if you ask me what I wish would have happened, that's a slightly different matter, and I suppose it would affect some of my considerations in thinking about the future. I think the Affordable Care Act does almost nothing to reduce the complexity of American relations to the financing of medical care. And over the next few years, I wish we would spend a lot of time studying, for example, how it is in Germany that they can have hundreds of sickness funds, common records, common terms, common benefits, so that Germans understand what they're entitled to, even though they're not in the same administrative apparatus. That would be one. A second one that I think is very important is to go back and reconsider, and this is illustrated by David's point. Most Americans did not think health care reform was about catastrophic coverage. They actually thought it was about prepayment, and maybe that's something we're never going to get to. But that discussion, so in a way, what I would say is the President of the United States and his allies need to rediscover the reasons they were so keen about health reform in the first place and make a more coherent and extensive case for it. Because what they did was send to the Congress an aspiration and not a conception of purpose or a philosophical account. We're the only society that I know of in the first world that ever had a discussion of universal health insurance without actually giving the moral grounds for doing so. Uh, it was the most technocratic discussion you could possibly imagine. And if we're going to do any improving of it, we better discover defensible purposes as to how we ought to reorganize it. That's where I would be.